Hello, welcome to the Tadi TV. My name is Jean Bord Bobak. I will be your host for today's uh, discussion called Invisible Threats, Similarities and Disparities of the COVID-19 Pandemic and the HIV AIDS Epidemic. Um, we're going to explore the topic with uh, three guests, with uh, Dr. Alexandra Juhas, uh, with John Grayson and Wieland Speck. Um, I'm very uh, happy to welcome all three of you. Alexandra and John are joining us uh, via Zoom, and I'm extremely happy to have Wieland here with me in the studio because this was an experience that I didn't have very often this week, that there would be someone in presence here. But this is also something we're gonna, we're gonna touch upon uh, in our talk. Um, yes, so before we start, let me just say a few words about our guests. Um, Alexandra Juhas is a distinguished professor of film at Brooklyn College, uh, City University of New York. She's a filmmaker and an activist as well. Um, she is the producer of the Teddy Award winning film The Watermelon Woman by uh, Cheryl Dunye, uh, which actually, as Alexandra was just saying um, before we went live, was exactly 25 years ago that this uh, film was shown here in Berlin. Uh, so that's also a lovely um, coincidence in a way. Um, yes, her work also explored um, HIV, AIDS, and the activism surrounding it with amazing works such as We Care, Women and AIDS, or Video Remains, just to name a few. And her most recent work is exploring HIV and COVID. John Grayson uh, is a video and film artist, and he's also a pioneer of new queer cinema. Um, AIDS activism played a pivotal role uh, in his body of work as well. Um, he is the director of multiple Teddy Award winning films, including Urinal, The Making of Monsters, and Uncut. Um, and this year, actually, his newest short film, International Dawn Chorus Day, is playing in the Berlin Alle Shorts. And Wieland Speck, uh, filmmaker, curator, also activist, and for us, very importantly, founder of one of the founders of the Teddy Award. So everything that you see here now and everything that's happening here this week in the Teddy studio, it would be absolutely impossible without Wieland's hard work and dedication. Um, he has been the head of the Panorama section of the festival for over two decades. Um, and HIV and AIDS was also a central topic um, in his work as well. So welcome, all three of you. I'm very happy that you could all be here and you accepted our invitation for this talk. Um, yeah, let's dive into it. Um, the first thing that I would like to address and that we should, I think, talk about um, is that ever since we are facing this new pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic, it came up again and again in the media, a comparison between the COVID-19 pandemic and HIV and AIDS. And it also sparked a lot of debates if this is at all possible to do that, is it ethical to do that? Um, and uh, yes, I'm wondering what do you think, um, in what ways can we compare the two that would be fruitful and that would be um, meaningful in a way. Alexandra, would you like to start? I'd be more than happy to start. <clears throat> I have a lot to say about this, so um, because I think it's really critical. Um, so I would say the, the similarities are that these are viral illnesses and they sit closely to tr trauma and fear for human beings, um, especially in that they're in that they were unknown and entered into our communities and bodies abruptly. And the only other similarity I would name that's important is that in the face of that trauma and fear, there's been a self-help movement that has come from the community of people who are suffering from COVID in response to uncertainty in particular, and a lack of institutional knowledge. 
So, uh, and that's a, that's a good thing. And that self-health movement has learned from AIDS activism, which learned from the feminist self-health movement for it. But there's a lot of differences. So I think it's useful. It helps COVID to learn from AIDS and the differences of HIV. And some of those, I'll list them pretty quickly. Our mortality rates are very different for people who have the virus. The modes of trans transmission are different. And that is, you know, underlies the stigma uh, associated to AIDS, how people uh, originally got HIV AIDS through sexuality and drug use. The response time from governments, medicine, the media is completely different. So in the first year right. of HIV, okay, so everyone gets that one. The amount of resources that have been poured in in the first year, can't compare. The awareness of the world can't compare. And that has to do with technology, but also, you know, who's afflicted. Now here's the last uh, similarity, stigma. So I'd like to think about COVID stigma today and why COVID stigma exists, because it does. I say this as someone who's had COVID and is now long hauling with COVID. It's, a per it's perplexing to me why there's stigma around having COVID. COVID. Uh, and then the last thing, again, this is important to me. Um, there's not yet a political movement. There's a self-health movement, but not a political movement in relationship to COVID-19. Now it's only been a year and I would like to hear John and uh, Vilan talk about where we were a year into HIV um, and you know, a nascent politics. But there, one of the reasons why there isn't a uh, COVID-19 politics is that we're all isolated from each other. And it's very hard to imagine doing the kind of politics we did around HIV when all of us are at home. And so put that on the table. And then finally, the role of technology has changed. Yeah, yeah. And it's affecting our ability to, in, in regard to all of these things, both positively and negatively. Yeah, absolutely. John, would you like to, to respond or add to that? I 100% agree. The differences are what we should focus on. Um, and the differences are, are Un unbelievably fundamental and, and sweeping. You know, a, a mask, it's not a condom. Um, the, 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 the crisis around stigma, and there's absolutely COVID stigma, but it's, it's day and night difference between what was experienced in the first decade of AIDS where whole populations, homosexuals, Haitians, hemophiliacs, heroin users, hookers, the 5-H club, the, the stigma and violence that was unleashed by a society, by a global society, was it, 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 it's, it's, uh, it, it's hard to get people back to remember what it was like, what that world was like. Um, I think as well, um, it, Alex has talked about the, the medical response. I think with the cultural response, it's been fascinating watching, thanks digital world, thanks YouTube, a COVID cinema uh, blossom. And so I've been part of, uh, I feel like I've been part of four new collectives that have commissioned short COVID films. And, and this one behind me, which is in Berlin Alley, crowdsourced, I got 40 friends from around the world to shoot their Don choruses. And so I was able to sit in my, uh, sit at home and collect footage from around the world to tell a, a short story, a, a queer story about Egypt. Uh, but um, COVID cinema has a completely different r rollout than what happened with AIDS cinema, where it was such a struggle in, those, in that first decade to get AIDS on screen in any meaningful way. And I really credit Berlin Alley for leading the way in terms of giving the support and the platform to early pioneers like Stuart Marshall or um, Rosa von Pranheim's Virus Has No Morals. These were landmarks that we are really important to remember in terms of AIDS cinema. And we're going to see that much, much more quickly with COVID cinema because there's so much more permission to speak about and talk about uh, this, this universally experienced disease pandemic. Right. But I think on top of that, um, there's more permission, but there's some of the technological changes that yeah. are different from when we 
when we were producing activist cinema in relationship to HIV is that it's that much more accessible, it's that much more at hand, and it's that much more spreadable, distributable, not just in easier to make, easier. So I was thinking about your collection that you did uh, for, uh, uh, what's it called, the name of the Canadian distributor, V-Tape? V-Tape, V-Tape yeah. and Video Data Bank and Video Against AIDS was a collection of six hours of short films, including yours, by about um, HIV and AIDS. About women and AIDS. Yours was about women and AIDS, exactly. Right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And that, that, you know, that, that work that you did to pull six hours worth of tape together and, and sell it as a package, that may have been the first time that work disseminated largely in that way on VHS tapes and people would buy the collection and then screen from it because it was, it, it's not like we didn't get the work out, but it's much harder than it was now and more cumbersome. Yeah. Absolutely. There, it, 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 go on. I, I heard Vilan, I think. Yes. Yeah, Vieland, uh, what, what, what is your uh, view? Well, a lot, of course, has been said just now. Um, very important and, and, and deep observations. Um, let me take the connotation from Alex on, on the technical difference. Uh, back then, only a few people spoke up and nobody listened. So we were in the position, as you said, John, in, in the Berlinale, to actually be the window, the needle's eye, so to speak, um, uh, to the case. And uh, people started to listen very focusedly after us not stopping bringing the topic up and the filmmakers, of course, not stopping to making new films about it. Um, so that was a big difference because today, you know, everyone can say everything at the same time and all over the place. So it's much more difficult to navigate and get to a point um, as it was back then. Um, John is wearing his t-shirt, Zero Patience. That was the first musical on AIDS and that was a great success in the festival uh, with great music too. We had the records and everything. And I still actually, I still have a cap. I should have brought it today with zero patients. And that was of course the patient number zero. And um, this is the smart way uh, John uh, was turning it around that we have no patients anymore because nobody listened. Uh, today, I think we have a situation which is the bare opposite of back then. Back then only a few people that nobody actually wanted to know that they exist had a deadly illness. Today, everybody has it. It's the bare opposite of an, of an experience. And still, you find many people today that think they are the only ones that have COVID, or they're the only ones that have to deal with this, because individualism from back then to today made big leaps. And I think we're actually almost on the on the end of individualism as an idea because it has perverted into something that brings out the neo-Nazis thinking they're individualists and uh, being against uh, measures that we all, most of us, think right. are reasonable. So um, we have like no right-wing voices back then. They just tried to like uns um, totzuschweigen, what's the word, uh, tried to, to, to uh, make us not exist by neglecting us. And still today, I think the main power of homophobia is not so much the neo-Nazism, it's, it's rather the liberal center being ignorant. So the ignorance is the, the homophobia of today. Um, and uh, at the same time, Many gay men have become now a population. Homosexuals have become a population, let's put it that way. And now we're fighting for the, for the trans people to be part of that population as well. Um, so this is the, 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 the point today, which uh, of course overlaps in a not very healthy way with this pandemic. So I think this is a big topic that we have to deal with. Yeah, absolutely. Um, would would Alexander John like to respond to what Vilan just said uh, right now? I have two additions that yes, connect. So I think that 
in relation to HIV politics and decades of working together and growing a movement uh, to improve the lives of people with HIV, disclosure has consistently been an, a political issue and has had its own um, uh, ups and downs politically, like highs and lows, but to disclose having HIV has its, has its own history. And the, the same is true now for COVID. Uh, and again, nascent politics of disclosure. So it was important for me to say that I've had COVID. I think a lot of people who've had COVID don't say that they've had COVID. I'm long hauling with COVID. That is a term that means, although I fought it successfully, I still have symptoms. Um, I will say they're not devastating symptoms. Uh, they aren't getting in the way of my life, but as many as 25% of people who've had COVID will long haul. And that is millions of people stay sick. And for some people that it, it is a disenabling illness, long hauling. Um, and we learned as artists and activists, and this is, I think what Vilan was saying, and, and, and distribution platforms and exhibition platforms and you know, using the media that we needed to put a name and a face and a story Absolutely. and a politics to having HIV. And we didn't want that to be controlled by mainstream media. So disclosure to me is, is as political is extremely important. Um, and I, I just wanted to add that to amplify what happened at the Berlinale and in, and in other cultural institutions that were brave enough to amplify our story when we were disclosing HIV in our communities and also taking control of representation, which is fundamental to the politics of filmmaking. Yes, uh, yes. We, we will get into the topic of representation in a few minutes uh, because that's absolutely crucial to this discussion, I think. But let me uh, go back a bit to this uh, starting question, how um, in the media comparisons uh, appeared about these uh, two pandemics. Um, one thing that I personally found quite troubling is that um, the HIV and AIDS uh, epidemic was used as kind of a past reference point to this and intentionally or unintentionally, but it rendered this, uh, this struggle as something of the past. Um, whereas it's, I think that's a problematic in this discussion. Uh, what would you say, Wieland, about, about, about this? I mean, what we realize... He needs his mic on. Oh, oh yeah, oh, the microphone. So, yeah, so, thank so, you. Sorry for that. Yeah. Thank you, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> Taking care of me. Thank God um, there's a filmmaker in the room. See, I was born with a microphone to my throat, and now I'm off duty, and I forget even to use it. Nice. Um, I think the past... Um, I know what you mean. Do you think it's kind of a fairy tale story, HIV today, uh, for many people? Exactly. Uh, it's, it's like a, 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 something like Game of Thrones or so. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, we should, we should look at zero patients again, I think. Uh, we, because we, that we was cannot... depicting uh, that dimension while it was happening. Yeah. Um, it was so big for those who were affected and for those who understood what it meant and we're not affected, maybe, um, that it uh, influenced what we do today very much. Not just COVID, but also the way we deal with each other. Uh, so the universities and the, especially the hospitals and, and doctors, they all have learned so much they can use now in a much better way. Uh, so the historical uh, touch might be for younger generation uh, so it's, of course, our job to sort of uh, not only keep that alive, but show what it meant and that it's a history that we stand on. And that today is not just today, because today move, uh, grew out of yesterday. Um, but that's a generational effort we have to do on so many levels all the time, uh, especially today because the media is uh, so overwhelming uh, to young people are just like busy with all their threads that they want to follow 
that are often enough, uh, well, if I look at it, I would say not worth it, but that's, of course, uh, my personal remark. But nevertheless, you have to find out what's worth it and not, and that keeps you so busy that 24 hours are not very much for, for, for a day. Yeah. Um, so this is, it's, it's on us uh, to, to like, uh, bring these things back, like the Kunstwerke, Contemporary Arts um, uh, Gallery in Berlin um, had a David Wonorowicz show, yes, which was huge uh, in New York. That show was, you know, things like that. And, and all of a sudden, young people come and see what's going on. Uh, we, uh, we had no idea uh, what this was. That anger of David's, for example, which, of course, we also had in, in Berlin. And, uh, yeah, these are the negotiations we just, just have to continue to do. Yeah, absolutely. Alexandra, um, what, would you, what would you say to this rendering oh. this? Oh, yes. Well, this, this is a cat. This is Mona. Um, this is what welcome. cats do usually. <laughs> so, sometimes she also joins the conversation. Uh, we will see what she will have to say. But the first time, I'm curious what Alex has to say. So uh, as, a, as a contemporary AIDS activist, uh, one of the things that I say with my cohort of activists is AIDS, the mantra AIDS is over or AIDS will be over is not helpful for people living with AIDS. Exactly. And it is still an epidemic. There, AIDS occurred in the past. And what we can learn from our activism at the beginning of the crisis and through the crisis ongoing is useful for us. But people have HIV now. And uh, people are dying of HIV now. And the people of HIV now are the people who've always had HIV, women, people of color, people of the global south, trans women, poor people. And this has always been a crisis of poverty and racism, structural inequality, access to healthcare, access to education, that has been the story of HIV and it still is for people with HIV all over the world. And um, so when COVID, I've heard people say the last pandemic, <laughs> meaning the one that's over, meaning the one that's complete, that's an AIDS is over logic that does, that is first untrue and secondly, takes away the lived experience of communities and individuals struggling in the face of HIV today. Um, so it's important to learn from our past and it's important to stay present focused as well. And now we have two pandemics that are happening at the same time. There's a word for that. I think it's called, I heard a talk about it yesterday, systemic or something like that. Um, and they, and these, pa these pandemics, Viral pandemics are happening in relationship to epi epidemics in other locations, like of healthcare, yeah, of civil rights, you know, etc. Yeah, um, and so they amplify each other. What we hope as activists is that we, they can also learn from each other and cross pollinate, so that people with COVID nineteen can learn from HIV politics and work with the HIV community political community as well. Yeah, thank, thank you for putting that out because I think it's extremely important to, to emphasize that this is not something of the past. Of course, it started in the past from today's point of view, but that this is an ongoing pandemic and this is, this is an ongoing uh, struggle. Um, let's talk about now about uh, HIV and AIDS uh, in particular. Um, I would like to ask you, um, what is your first memory uh, with, with, with HIV? Do you remember still that moment when, when you heard about it for the first time, John? I sure do. I, I think we all remember uh, that the first time it registered. I was, in, I was living in New York with my boyfriend. We were painting the loft and we were using the New York Times to keep the paint off the floor. And uh, my eye, when I was laying out the newspaper, caught that tiny little, uh, uh, so, many, so many men uh, sick with pneumonia on Fire Island. I, I don't know if I'm remembering the exact article, but I remember vividly that moment where Tony and I stopped and went, what the fuck is this? And 
And then we life went on. And then weeks, months, and the word kept coming through because of course it was New York. And the first person I knew that fall uh, was our janitor at my job, um, a film organization. And he was this cute clone with the mustache and the leather jacket. And then he wasn't there anymore. He was, and I was, I asked our boss, where's, where's Bob gone? And it was like, he's sick. He's, he's called him sick. He's, and three months later he died. So it was early. It was 81. Yeah. Wieland. Well, I came back in 1980 from San Francisco, where I lived for a while and uh, also went to the Art Institute and made my first film that actually brought me to the Berlinale because it was picked by Manfred Salzgeber for the 81 Berlinale. And uh, then I asked, uh, can I get a job? Um, <laughs> so that much for, for that history. But um, when I came back in 1980 to Berlin from San Francisco and Los Angeles, um, the first thing I heard, there's a, a cancer that affects gay men. So this must have been 81, I guess, as well. Um, and I just realized I come from where that happened or where that is. And uh, well, it's, it's only uh, due to circumstances that I'm still alive uh, because I lived exactly in the two years, one and a half years in San Francisco where the most spreading actually happened. Um, so that developed very quickly into doctors trying to find out uh, what that could be, the Tropen Institute, the Tropical Institute. In 81, 82, started to make uh, um, uh, research on, on, on this kind of, they thought it might be some tropical disease. And uh, they asked uh, gay men, and I was in a gay commune, and my whole commune went there to the hospital. And, and we got to uh, give our blood and sperm and everything. And they were trying to find out what it was. So this was the very beginnings before there was a term for the whole. And uh, then it developed quite quickly. In 84, I made this film, Vestla, and uh, I had no scene relating to, to HIV, which was not called HIV yet. Um, and uh, that uh, made me great sorrow. And I, and I wrote um, quickly a scene that would at least address the thing. And the television, who was my producer, didn't want that. Scene. It doesn't help the story. Da, da, da. It wasn't in. So right after that, um, I, I said, OK, we have to do Because we just learned safer sex, that at least a condom would be like uh, an important new tool. Uh, which was a totally heterosexual thing. Uh, homosexuals did not know what a condom was, basically. Of course, you knew it somehow because you got horny when you found a used one somewhere on a corner as a kid. Uh, but uh, it was not part of gay life at all. So we had to make it part of uh, gay life in a very short period of time, as quickly as possible. And uh, so I made the, the, the first set of, of um, videos promoting uh, the rubber, which premiered actually in Montreal in 19, when was that? Uh, I forgot, 89. 1989 at International AIDS Conference. The International AIDS Conference. And, and uh, we were accused of, of, of killing people because we showed that a rubber also can break and stuff. It was very dramatic time. You know, because yeah. nobody knew exactly what was going on and uh, you had all kinds of reactions and gay men at that point only just learned that you have to care for someone. Yes. Because at that point hedonism was in its first big height and uh, uh, that was the freedom gays never had for the first time they had it and right then that deadly threat came. No wonder that there were all kinds of uh, theories that this is a produced virus, etc., just to like kill those homos or to test a, a military thing. And uh, why not take that group? That's perfect uh, because they're they're like a close group, etc. So all these theories that you have today against. Um, the measures of, of um, governments on, on the COVID level, um, these uh, Verschwörungstheorie, what is that in English? 
conspiracy, conspiracy theories. theories. Thank right. you. Thank you. Uh, where uh, where exactly the same kind of the, that we have today. Yeah, Alexandra. Uh, I'd you... love to tell my first story, and it connects to what Vilan said. Please. I think that. Yeah. Um, lesbians and feminists really worked with gay men to learn how to care and cared for gay men. And that is the onset, in my mind, of queer community and queer politics and queer identity. Because lesbians and feminists joined gay men to take care of them when people in their communities were dying and needed help and were not getting help from governmental organizations or any kind of organizations. And suddenly, women and men were organizing together. And from that, queer cinema and queer politics bloomed from women and lesbians and feminists coming to care for their dying friends. Yeah. And um, that was an awful time. And it was an awful way to find each other. But the legacy of that has been inspiring and beautiful and important for my life and for cinema. So my story is that I was in college in uh, New England, in the country, uh, for those of you who aren't from the United States, in the middle of Massachusetts at the little college. And I was in love with a closeted gay man. And he was in love with me. And we were having some kind of queer romance. Uh, and he was getting interview magazine delivered to him in the middle of nowhere. And I don't think that many people read it there in New England. And, and he told me that there was a cancer that gay men were getting. And he would go to New York to have sex and party and sell himself. I mean, all kinds of things at that age um, and come back. And there was parts of it I understood and parts of it I didn't and parts of it he understood and parts of it he didn't because we were kind of isolated and um, but it was seeping into our consciousness. And I would say that was from far away, you know, about 85, that yeah. that entered my consciousness through his fear. And also his interest in becoming a fully sexual adult was already had a, shadow on it a very light shadow and i perceived that as well and it was ominous and scary and um sad and yeah. that that man is uh, died of aids at the age of 29 his name is jim lamb and i've made a large body of work around his life and death and i continue to do that because he was very important to me and remembering him is important to me and he is my one person, but we all have our own. Well, oh, thank you. Thank you for sharing it. Oh, yeah, um, getting emotional here a bit. Um, yes, uh, let's talk about how how all of you, because all of you, it was very important for your filmic work to, to address that. Alexandra just pointed at that um, through this very uh, personal story as well. Um, yeah. How did you approach this topic when when you felt like, okay, it needs to get on the screen, John? Um, it started it started in the mid eighties, and I I really want to echo Al what Alex invokes in terms of us being in the crucible, us being right thrown in the pit together, and how uh, both terrifying, but also how liberating that was in terms of new types of alliances and new types of collaborations. And there was a take, uh, take no prisoners approach to media. The edits were rough and the camera work was all over the place. And there was none of that film school polish that we were supposed to aspire to. It was about grabbing images and getting them out and using public access cable, the roughness of public access and using the uh, crazy through the mail networks of VHS through the mail, um, as well as festivals like the Berlin Alley, but also the emerging network of queer festivals to try and put AIDS up on screen and put the activism up on screen. And Zero Patience for all its, the, you know, I'm very self-critical of it in retrospect, but I think it was this genuine attempt to capture 
the urgency and agency and humor and wit and sass and courage and anger of that time and that that movement and that activism and and try to capture what it was like to be you know doing a die in uh, during the day trying to fight for for treatment drugs but then your afternoon becomes a hospital visit visiting someone who's dying and then a care team meeting that night trying to navigate how do we uh, how do we deal with this person's crazy family these that sort of lived back and forth between the the minutia of taking care of each other and the big politics of taking on Reagan, Mulroney, the the monsters, Thatcher, the monsters of that 80s era. Um, that back and forth was certainly the spirit that drove me to make the, I I I look back and I think there's Zero Patience, which was the big film, trying to trying to get out there in the multiplexes. And we did to some degree. But all equally important, I think it's important to remember the small tapes, the the tapes made for five cents, like I made the ads epidemic or Moscow does not believe in queers or the pink pimpernel or the world is sick about, about the Montreal AIDS conference, the activism at the Montreal AIDS conference. These had much tinier audiences, but that, that indie media instinct of sometimes speaking to five people in a small room can have reverberations and echoes. Yeah, um, great. It's very good that you that you are talking about uh, zero patience. I think we have a clip uh, from the movie, so I would like to ask our team to roll that clip now. Great, um, John. Can you can you just a, a bit reflect on on this? Especially, how did you come to to this decision of using um, musical uh, as as a vehicle to to talk about uh, HIV and AIDS? There was a there was an explosion of um, of low budget, punky. Uh, queer, campy videos coming out of ACT UP and coming out of the AIDS activist movement, but they weren't reaching a broader audience. And so it was this, it felt like there was this funny window in Canada. There was permission for a new generation of filmmakers to maybe stick their necks out. And so we applied and we, we raised some money. It was a small budget relatively, but a bigger budget than most of the AIDS media at that time. Um, and the, the, the pitch was trying to use the musical form as Trojan horse to penetrate the fluffy discredited musical of the of that of that era um, the most unlikely vehicle possible for serious AIDS activist politics about fighting back um, but use it as a Trojan horse to penetrate and to maybe try and keep a hostile audience in the room using humor using music make maybe if we can get their toes tapping they'll listen they'll it, it's a way of putting a, a representation in their lives of people living with AIDS. Um, so I think that I think the core for me, the epitome of me, uh, or the, ex the the key example would be working with Michael Callan, the incredible, inspiring AIDS activist from New York, um, who 
was the pioneer of safer sex. He loved, he, you know, he loved to say he invented safer sex um, and did amazing pioneering activist work, but equally was um, a stunning, uh, he, he toured with a group called the, Fals the not the falsettos, um, it, it was uh, it, a, an amazing a cappella singer with a four, vo a four octave range. So I wrote the role of Miss HIV for him. So the, the key scene was him in zero, him having, him arguing with patient zero. Um, he's in patient zero's bloodstream and he's fighting back and making the arguments um, with patient zero and, and Richard Burton about blame and stigma and how patient zero was actually a hero for uh, being so frank and proud about his sexuality. He helped us understand AIDS was sexually transmitted. Um, and so Michael's role in the bloodstream of patient zero is the crucial, um, the, 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 one of the crucial scenes in the film. But it's important to know that when we shot that scene, Michael had half a lung left. He had just come out of hospital with another bout of pneumonia. We told him, look, we'll wait, just get better. And he said, you don't understand, like, this is it. If we don't shoot this week, who knows? And so... He went in the studio and with half a lung, he sung uh, this amazing solo. He held a note longer on screen than Barbara Streisand ever did with half a lung. That was, that was what, one of his conditions. I'm gonna, be in the, I'm gonna be in your film if I can hold the note longer than Barbara <laughs> and if I can wear her wig from on a clear day. <laughs> and, so, and he came on set and he, he flirted with all the grips and gaffers, they, they were, they, they were delighted and blushing. Um, he was Michael and heartbreakingly, he never saw the finished film. He saw a rough cut, but uh, passed before the film was finished. Uh, but uh, the spirit of Michael really, I feel like it is the spirit of what we were trying to do with Zero. Very beautiful. Thank you. Um, one way in which um, these films could get a platform is through film festivals. So I would like to turn to Wieland and, uh, and ask um, how did this all happen and, and, and how did you approach um, including uh, these stories about HIV and AIDS in the, in, the, in the film festival in the Berlinale because this was one of the, one of the platforms where it was often showed and discussed. Well, at that point, um there weren't that many queer films, of course. We didn't say queer yet either. Uh, it was gay and lesbian. And trans came pretty much at the time when we understood about AIDS. So it was gay, lesbian, and trans. That became difficult to say for the media. So we switched to queer, and the Teddy became a queer film award. Um, that much to the history from that side. Today, queer has uh, many different... Uh, and, uh, connotations. Mm -hmm. um, many of the films that we saw when we were looking for films throughout the year were not of the caliber that we could show in the festival. Um, that means the festival is of course an A festival, so you have to have a certain um, amount of, 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 of things that happen, even, even if it's length or that they have to be a world premiere and all kind of shit. So um, what we did is we showed all the films that we found worthy at night at the gay bookstore, besides those that were in the festival. So dur during the day, we would have like a whole day until night um, in the festival. And then we would even gather for the rest of the night in the gay bookstore just to start early next day again with the festival films. Uh, so we had all these discussions that were subcultural discussions and I think this is a very important connotation to the time and also for observation of today. Um, subculture was very strong back then. Today I would say subculture is not strong. Uh, today uh, the queer umbrella has gathered so many different elements that uh, a subcultural radical work is hardly possible. The most subcultural radical work today is actually the, the trans and the, the, the racism uh, aspect of it, which is great, but it's not really, it, it doesn't, well, it moves a subculture, but at the same time, everything is in, on Twitter. 
So um, the development is, is very rough and very, uh, it's difficult to, to have it, how shall I put it? Um, I think you have to breed an egg uh, in a corner for a while before you can like offer what comes from it. And this, this moment we had, and that moment we created again and again and also cherished it. And uh, I wish sometimes we would have more of that today, meaning being queer in the whole sense of a population, which is very important, of course, which also AIDS helped a lot yes. to, for the society to recognize that we exist, because with a death threat, you're much easier to be recognized than just with being a happy person that shouldn't be happy. So um, all these elements come together, and um, I think the, um, the challenge for today is to look closely to ideas that we are not used to because they might be new or they put in the elements in a, in a new way and, and foster them to develop to something. Uh, rather than, than um, uh, showing so many boundaries that we see today, uh, people are afraid of, can I say this? Am I allowed to say that? That is, um, that is not a healthy way to like, actually develop new thoughts. So um, I think we can learn from the times when we were all in different um, subcultures uh, for today on that respect. And I also wanted to say, Alex, do you, you pointed out, that was great to, uh, to point out how gays and lesbians, uh, gay men and lesbian women at that time sort of started to understand something of a togetherness. Um, I think in Germany or in Europe, I don't know, but in Germany we quite missed that point. Uh, so we had a, a situation where um, the lesbian world was not really interested in, in what happened to the gay world, and the gay world was not really interested for the lesbians to join in either, uh, except for personal cases, of course, they were there, but it, was not a, it, it did not develop into a movement thing, which is also, of course, has to do with um, uh, how feminism developed in Germany uh, in the uh, late 60s, early 70s, um, and lesbians were more with the, with the feminist women, of course, that were basically against men, so men were put in the same pot, no matter if they're gay or not, uh, which for us always was an incredible uh, um, uh, we were like furious about this because we were put in the same pot with our enemies, you know, so we had a different uh, thing there. But nevertheless, uh, I think we slowly also learned to do that and the queer term also helped to learn that. And uh, today we have a much different amalgam of uh, the different queernesses, uh, let's say, um, than we used to have, which is a good thing. Yeah, Alexander, Alex, would you like to, to respond uh, to, what, to what just Wieland said? And, uh, and in the meanwhile, as like after, after, after you, you connect to what Wieland just said, I would also like if you could uh, talk a bit about your work on women and AIDS in particular, because I think that's also very important and it could be a good connection here. Absolutely. So thank you for uh, nuancing that history. I think it is really... Uh, it's hard for me not to theorize from an American perspective or a, a North American perspective. And, you know, th these political histories are, are infecting each other in the best sense and also unique uh, to the places that we live in and um, struggle and love. And I think one of the connections I would make to your point, Veland, is that AIDS politics, AIDS activism, queer activism at that time did happen in small local homegrown settings like bookstores or bars or clubs or uh, in New York City at the Gay and Lesbian Center where ACT UP occurred, but lots of other meetings happened. We, we did do this work locally. And I think, um, and in face-to-face, -face, and that is one, we're thinking about COVID, that we can't get that passionate connection um, is really making a COVID politics hard. And I think connecting to John's point about working with Michael Callan, I think it's very hard for people today to understand and in, in the best sense, what it was like to be living with friends and community members who were dying. And we aren't 
seeing that with COVID, the way that we lived it with AIDS. So, you know, half of 500,000 people have died of COVID in the United States. And I was at a meeting yesterday about HIV and COVID lecture. 700,000 Americans have died of AIDS in 40 years. And that is a huge number, but we are not seeing dying people around us, the people that we love, they're dying in isolation and we are in isolation. And we were fueled by that death of our loved ones and their illness. And every day we would start again because it's horrible to live around people who are dying. It's horrible to love people who are dying. It's horrible when people you love die and it decimated our communities. And so, and it is still doing that. I wanna remind you, there are communities who suffer in that way today from HIV. And I also wanted to say about John's work, and this, it oddly connects me to the watermelon woman. I love that he worked with humor in that film. So that, and that sort of oscillation between how serious it was, how sad it was, how unfair and brutal it was, was met with humor and joy and song and beauty. And that what is and was the AIDS activist movement to me. And that's what Cheryl did with Watermelon Woman. She, she wanted to share something that seemed threatening and she did it and does it still with humor, with passion, you know, with joy. And, and there's lessons to be learned from John's work and Cheryl's work in this regard. Um, my short, my first AIDS work, Women in AIDS did not, <laughs> was not, I don't think there was much humor in it. Um, it was for the Gay Men's Health Crisis Living with AIDS show. It's a, it's a public okay. access television show that was run by Jean Carlo Musto in New York City. And we were, that was the, its first half an hour show was Women in AIDS. I was 23 years old. I did not know how to make film. I was not a film student. It could never have been in the Berlinale because it was what John had said a different, not an A-level film. It was cable access television for New York City. And then it traveled as a VHS tape. In 1987, I was a kid and I was a feminist. I was a nascent queer thinker. And I joined other f feminist activists in New York and around the world who were trying to make people hear that, as John said, AIDS wasn't about risk groups. That was bad science. It was nonsensical. It was also racist, homophobic, and sexist at its core. It was a virus. And everyone was going to get it unless they took precautions. And w women had it already. And, you know, the focus on gay men in the history of AIDS, starting at the beginning to this day, is at once true because that community has been decimated and is continuing to be scarred by HIV, but, but it has never been about homosexuality. It is not about being gay. It is a virus and the virus has moved around the world and affected poor people, women and people of color disproportionately from the onset of AIDS. And we knew that in 1987 and it's still true to this day. And that has been very hard to share uh, and circulate. Um, again, I don't say this against the amazing work that my gay male compatriots did, but gay men took up a lot of the airspace um, because they could, because they had yeah. access to resources yeah. and accesses to, access to power and access to technology because they were men. And this connects to the conversation that Vilan and I were having, a feminist critique of male power. And... Yes. Um, women and AIDS, which I made, is, one, is not the first, but it's one of the very first pieces yeah. of media about women and AIDS, maybe the second or third, is trying to make a feminist and what we now call, but also called at the time, an intersectional analysis that understood that the experience of women and AIDS was connected to racism, poverty, lack of access to healthcare, education, and men's brutality in relationship to women's access to their own sexuality. And one of the things that's frustrating to me about being an AIDS activist ongoing, people think that they're inventing these ideas now <laughs> or this analysis. 
Yeah. And it's been at the heart of AIDS activism from the beginning. Yeah. We've understood this from the beginning. We didn't figure it out now. We knew it then. Right. And that's what that film is about. Yeah. And I think we also have a clip from Women and AIDS. So I will ask to, to show that ex excerpt because this is also very important. Women take care of everyone. Who takes care of women? No one. Who takes care of the women? No one. I mean, we get support here from Sulita and so on, but to an extent. But when I go home, who takes care of me? Sometimes no I'm there. sick and I, I can barely get up. I mean, I have arthritis. As young as I, my knee is always going out on me. I, I can't even get up out of my bed. And I wish somebody was there to at least bring me a cup of tea or a little Well, right now I'm there and I bring her the cup of tea. If I don't go to work, who's going to support me? Who's going to support my child? I've been dying of this disease since 1981. I don't even want to talk about that. But, uh, and nothing really was done until 86. Suddenly, because the, there's a threat coming. Great. Um, yes. So, so this was, I think, also very, very important to address and and to and to show, particularly because um, I, when I was preparing for for this talk, I just read a study that actually um, the population living with AIDS, or living with HIV or AIDS right now, actually more than 50% of them are women. Uh, at least this this, uh, this study showed that. So I think it's very important that women's voice, that women voices would be included in this discussion and it would be pointed out because, yeah, as Alexandra very eloquently said, it is very often um, connected um, to, to gay male population however it's 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 a different story but would one of you john or Wieland, would like to connect to what uh, alex was just saying before before we showed the clip maybe john or Wieland? Yeah, but i haven't seen the clip unfortunately yes of course so yeah or what alex was saying more so john was about to open yes. his mouth <laughs> It's, uh, I, I, I'm, I, I'm reminded of that moment and trying to connect it to media practice today and thinking in particular about giving voice to those who aren't getting the microphone. Um, I think Alex's work and Jean's work was so important. I, I also, you know, still screen Doctors, Liars and Women for uh, classes talking about media theory and media intervention. Um, these were such landmark works in terms of, um, act up taking up women's issues in meaningful ways. And I look today to how media likewise is, is playing a role, reminding us about what, what the pandemic looks like today. Again, echoing Alex, when we think about the AIDS today in the global south, um, in, in world situations, in prisons, in poor communities, um, th those intersections of um, drug use and poverty and and how racialized peoples are disproportionately affected and I think of like the simplest Google Google visual aids um, and you'll find a co an annual compilation of commissioned films primarily from the United States but this last year they did a global commission and so it's trans activists and first-time filmmakers and women from all over the world, from Chile and Mexico and Africa, speaking about their their lived realities of HIV, to, living with HIV today, and it's so energizing and so so specific. And I think the greatest um, lessons from AIDS activism then that we can carry forward now, and what Visual AIDS carries forward now, is the specificity, a local personal story. The, like people speaking from their own perspective about what it means to live with AIDS today is the most important message that we can uh, we can we can get on screen. And I'm I'm in the process of um, inspired by visual aids. I'm in the process of um, organizing a, a project called Viral Interventions, and we're commissioning 
filmmakers from around the world to make short films following that same model. Some looking back, some looking back historically, and some very much in the present right now, because I think um, the 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 AIDS fight today, and this has been true for almost 20 years, has been about an apartheid, a treatment apartheid in particular between what's available in the global north to save lives, what we what we fought for, we actually achieved with the the subsequent generations of protease inhibitors, which truly saved lives. And I speak very locally about this. My boyfriend's alive downstairs, still sleeping, but alive today uh, because the drugs arrived just in time. He was on death's door in 96, but started taking pills. And, you know, now we are 25 years later and he's with us and, and a whole generation of people survived because those drugs were made available in the global north. And they're still not available in the global south. And this remains for us a huge fight against big pharma and a huge fight against the world AIDS bureaucracies who continue to dump AZT on the global south. Enough of there I'm ranting in the old style way of the no, please. late 80s. By all means. But this is, I think, also a great point to bring in issues of representation, um, which I think we, we should talk about. Um, especially in the context of visibility and invisibility. We've seen a lot of loads of works uh, throughout uh, the time that addressed HIV through invisibility and that were problematizing how the media visualized um, AIDS and HIV. Um, what can you say about this, this dilemma, how to bring HIV and AIDS in a visual form, for instance, to, to the big screen. Willand, maybe we can start with, with you this time. Well, I have no exact idea to that at this point. Um, I mean, the world has seen until the 80s so many pandemia, especially in the world that doesn't even have the medication against HIV. Right. Um, so there were um, many other uh, terrible things happening to people. So we have to deal with the North-South. We have to deal with, in our own society, with the class system. I, I think it, it uh, nowadays, I think it pretty comes down uh, to that um, that we have to go back to class and uh, redefine it um, uh, for our today's purposes in order to detect uh, the, the problems the society has today. The consciousness about the global situation, the world, the earth, the insane earth uh, getting more and more sick, uh, kind of thing. I mean, we were talking about this 40 years ago. There's no doubt about it. For me, the importance is not bigger today than back then, only that uh, more people talk about it, which is good, and more people m create waste, which is bad. Um, but at the we, we're still at the same uh, kind of level. How can we make things better? And uh, we have to find uh, ways to collaborate. Uh, I, I, for me, it's not easy to make a connection to HIV because HIV is, of course, still there. Uh, we all know, and uh, but you cannot put it like above something now, uh, like putting on a big screen. I would not know how to do that. Uh, no, I mean, I, I, I hated Philadelphia back then. I was puking <laughs> for at the instance, screen, you and see, it was that, in the Berlinale. I mean. You know, it was in my own festival. But of yeah. course, it was in competition. I could not uh, hinder it. Uh, but <laughs> nevertheless, uh, um, how can you film 90 minutes around a kiss that doesn't happen? Uh, and uh, <laughs> these things, of course, have, uh, would be still some uh, would not be a problem today. I would say, but uh, nevertheless. Um, to go too much into detail, I think today we should try to see a bigger picture that also creates the possibilities of solidarity between people that are rather um, uh, misstrauish. What's the word? Um, Sag nochmal? 
uh, distrustful, yes, distrustful is part of it, definitely. Um, uh, we don't trust many people today because we're all blabbing at the same time and not listening. Um, so I think we should just sort of get focuses uh, um, in this, uh, so solidarity has a bigger... I think we talk so much about diversity because the diversity shrank over the last 15 years so much that we now realize uh, every individual is basically an own unity and there's uh, not much solidarity. At the same time, we have Fridays for Future. We get like a feeling for a movement that I easily relate to. Um, we have lots of people working for Greenpeace and for Amnesty International. There's a lot of things happening. Um, we just have to get a focus on, on, on um, away from the distractions that uh, today's media also bring in. I yeah. Don't know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Alexander, would you like to, to connect to that? Sure. I think a couple um, ways to continue this conversation is to say, for people who are continuing to do HIV AIDS activism, for instance, the group that I'm most involved with right now called What Would an HIV Doula Do?, who is now doing COVID activism related to HIV activism, I think the question of undetect undetectability for people who have access to medication has become a sort of game changer in relationship to thinking about politics of visibility. And so that is connected. So I pivot a little bit. I do a body of writing and thinking with the uh, AIDS cultural theorist and activist, Ted Kerr. We are finishing a book right now, which will be coming out soon, I hope from Duke University Press, um, where we periodize the cultural history of AIDS. And I'm making this connection because Ted and I talk about the current body of film and video, and there's a lot of it about AIDS, we call AIDS crisis revisitation. So when we see AIDS in contemporary media, and we do all the time, I'll just point, for instance, to It's a Sin, which just came out here in the United States. And it also it plays at the Berlinale, in the Berlinale okay. series this year, yes. It looks back. It only thinks about AIDS as something that was in the past, and here again is that politics of it's over. So we can look at it safely because it's over. People now, at least people have access to medication, now live good, healthy lives. That's, that's a win. So because we can look backwards, we think about the trauma and victories of a previous generation without trying to make work about the lived experience of people with HIV, lived experience of people with HIV, gay men and others who are on medication are undetectable. And that produces an entirely different logic of visibility. And we're grasping with that to talk about it, to see it, to name it, to live with it, to live with it inside of community, to have sex. And, you know, given that people are undetectable, these, this is the current politics of HIV. It's live, it's exciting, it's important. Um, so uh, th that's what I would add to the conversation. And I think... Um, the through lines between that and COVID are strange, <laughs> right? Because it's a, a treatable disease and COVID is not. Um, so COVID activists can be heartened by and learn from a movement that in people's lifetime, in John's husband or boyfriend's lifetime saved him. Yeah. And, yeah. and um, you know, my hat's off. You know, I certainly do not want to go down in any way as anything but celebrating and thanking gay men for every single piece of cultural capital, money, art making, passion, care that they have done in this story. So I want to celebrate that and thank them for where we are um, in relationship to people living with HIV. And, you know, I hope that that same kind of attention and capital will follow in relationship to the millions and millions of people who are and will suffer with COVID. Yeah, and I think we can, we can look at these, these uh, uh, historical representations like it's a sin and, and, you know, celebrate what is being said in them. It's a sin is centered around a young woman who's the only one with the brain in a collective of gay men out on the town discovering their bodies and their, and their sexualities for the first time. 
And she's the, she's the thread through that series who brings activism and, and uh, some caring. It, it's, a, it's a thoughtful depiction. I think a more exciting one um, is um, the community represented in Poses last season, where we see the pose, we see the the um, house, uh, the the houses that in the Vogue scene uh, get involved in ACT UP, and they actually restage the St. Patrick Cathedral occupation, and they do so in the writing is quite extraordinary, and it's quite critical of the white white male privilege that was at the heart of ACT UP, but that was also contested. So there's, there's representations on screen, I think of Beats Per Minute from France. There's representations on screen which capture the complexity of the activism then in ways which are rich and, and are true to the conflicts that occurred between us. Agreed. So um, what I will say, so when T Ted and I theorize AIDS cultural production at this moment, we call it AIDS crisis normalization. And it, that comes from AIDS crisis revisitation, a past focused AIDS cultural production, which is primarily still what we see. So look at what you've listed. All of those are great pieces of filmmaking about the moment where we all became activists, the moment we lived through our generation. Yeah. Um, and that has changed uh, to be more inclusive and tell more stories in part because of contemporary struggles in AIDS activism around issues of representation. So Pose is a perfect example of that. But yeah. uh, in any case, what would it look like? What does it look like when we show what it is to live with HIV now? Where are those movies? They're, they're on visual aids. That is correct. And by yeah. the way, I was on the selection committee that chose the, the amazing last two rounds of films. And I'm really glad that you shouted out visual aids. It's really important work that's, that they're, they're funding. Um, and, and that's correct. That is, and so I, I, it, I think it's an exciting moment that the revisitation allowed a lot of us to heal, to remember, to acknowledge our trauma, to celebrate the, the work that people did before us and the, suffering of people before us, but also then has given us some permission to move on and be now in the present and witness the lives of the people living and suffering from HIV now, living with and suffering and fighting. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's talk about care as well, because I think whenever it comes to a pandemic or some sort of a crisis, uh, like the HIV AIDS crisis or this current uh, COVID-19 uh, crisis as well, care is important. Like that's the only way how we can cope with it and how we can go through. Um, can you tell us um, a bit about um, models of care and the role of community in that in, in the time when, um, when HIV and AIDS appeared? And we already touched upon this. This has many difficulties today with the COVID because we are so isolated. And I wonder how, in what ways can we effectively care for each other when actually physical presence between each other is seen as a threat in the current moment? Uh, maybe we can start with VLAND. Hmm, a difficult um, question because it's an experience we all go through for the Absolutely. first time. Uh, and that makes it already extraordinary. Um, every single person is affected, not in the same way, of course, because every person is different, but objectively in the same way. Um, not to touch another person for such a long period of time um, is one thing. Um, not to travel. I mean, I've never been in my life for that long in Berlin, you know, than in the past year. But this is something everyone can, can easily uh, understand because everyone is in the same thing. The, the care aspect is, uh, of course, in the AIDS times, we learned to care. We learned to 
step back from hedonism and realize that there is more than just like uh, having sex. Um, that step was a huge step. I don't know how that would translate to today's situation at all. I mean, I have like so many one-on-one -on -one walks, like many people do. Uh, I spend more time with one person in a, in, 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 in one uh, session, so to speak, uh, than I ever did. Uh, people that I know for decades, all of a sudden I spend three hours in a row with them. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, it becomes uh, a care that is also connected with being together and not being distracted and not being in a party, but with one person. I think there, there, there are changes that come from that in, in, in the social behavior. Um, I'm now I'm not on Facebook and, and, and those social media, so that's of course. Uh, so I, I'm I'm a little bit of an outsider in, in in many ways, on that level because many people connect on that. But I'm uh, also have like a, a smartphone and and uh, do messaging, so that is also happening a lot. Of course, more than usual, email even uh, the fax machine is broken. Um, but uh, the care aspect is something that has turned into a new dimension. And um, of course, we have always the connotation of uh, female as caring and male as receiving. Um, uh, that was broken by gay men uh, back then, a big deal. And that also brought some sort of respect, uh, I must say, to uh, gay men, which they didn't have before. Um, and now we have um, most women working in, in, in the care business being paid uh, less, as we all know. I mean, this is all discussed in the media and nothing seems to be really happening against this. The privatization of, of health care and all that. Um, these are uh, things we have to politically fight against and, 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 and put the finger on. Uh, um, what it really does to us on, on the sub-level or the meta-level of, of human relationships, we don't even know yet exactly. So uh, that will be a very interesting thing. And I wonder um, if uh, John is right that there will be so many films dealing with the COVID situation. John is very fast in doing that. But I don't, I'm not sure if the world is fast on that. Uh, usually when something big happens, uh, it takes quite a while until something reasonable comes uh, from it. Um, so let's see. Yeah, let's see. Um, John, would you like to would you like to add to this? Would you like to connect? I think I think we can again picking up on what Alex has described in terms of our current digital moment. We're living in a completely different world, and so even though we're in isolation, we've never been more connected. Here we are speaking from four different cities together about this global situation, and I think the contrast. On the one hand, I, I have that my inbox fills up every day with new operas, new dance pieces, new, new COVID dance, new COVID opera, new COVID plays. Everybody's being so creative. The artists are exploding, figuring out their Zoom cameras and exploiting. And we're all having so much fun. And on the other hand, what's in my inbox, but headlines about situations like Israel-Palestine, where you have this apartheid between uh, access to vaccine Israel, one of the most jabbed country places in the world, high rollout of vaccine. And on the other hand, almost complete denial of vaccine rollout for people literally five miles away. And what, the, the, the inequities, the political struggles, um, the COVID's rolling out for us day by day um, around the globe. Are we, are we using our, our media tools, our Zoom cameras, to talk about the right things. I think that's the, that's the, or the urgent work isn't that we have access to the tools, the urgent work or, or the ability to get it out. Um, the, the crucial thing is, are we focusing on the right things? Are, 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 are our debates, our political debates about this pandemic focusing on, the, uh, focusing on what's really going on? Yeah, thank you. Alex, uh, what is your point of view? A number of, just continuing what I've heard, I, I, one of the things that I 
as a media theorist wrote about early in the pandemic, was what it looked like to engage in a media of proximity. So as opposed to social I, social isolation, I'm sorry, social distancing and isolation, using media to produce proximity. And I, I, I really resonate with Vilan's point about what it's like to be with a, one other human being for an hour, for three hours, for three months, for a year, and the co- intensity of proximity that is produced face to face and what it would be like to build together media experiences like that. And I think we are. So I think that like radical COVID cinema and radical COVID communication is trying to build the feeling and intensity and um, meaning of proximity into these technologies against the corporate systems that have been underwire all of these interactions. And I'm excited about that as, you know, my, my more recent work is as a scholar of, of, um, of the internet. And this has been something, being, bringing feminist and queer principles to internet life has been very important to me. And, and I think that COVID is gonna help with that. It's broken our stupid, dumb, thank you so much for giving me free things. Thank you for giving me you know, YouTube, whatever, without a critique or TikTok or Instagram, without a critique of the systems underneath it and what it's producing in people. And I'm hearing Vilan say that and I'm, I'm doubling down on Vilan's perspective there. I will say that the COVID care looks like mutual aid. We've seen this all over the world. And again, these are not things we're learning in COVID. They're things that are coming back. What it means to help people in your block, in your building, in your town, giving them food, helping them shop, getting them in the United States appointments. Um, That mutual aid care that occurs locally has been radically important to our lives in COVID and for people with COVID. And it's exciting to see that happening now as it has historically for communities who are in crisis. Again, mutual aid was what gay men invented for us when HIV began to decimate that community. Every city, every country, gay men's health crisis, just for example, came from in the community helping itself when no one else would and then became a model to help everyone with HIV. Um, The last thing I'd say is um, in the clip that you showed about women and AIDS, I I love that clip because it centers this question of care at the heart of living with HIV yourself and in your family. And um, that is the central question for COVID. I think that um, the work, the activist work that I do with the What Would an HIV Doula collective, we've been thinking about COVID, we've made some zines. It's very similar to the, you know, what it was like 25 years ago when we, when a crisis is unfolding, you know, you make things quickly, they're expendable, you know, no one cares if they're the the best thing you can do, you don't have funding for it anyway, and we've been spitting them out now for about a year. Um, I hope you'll put access to them somewhere if people want to see the zines that we've produced. Absolutely. And they, they come from the lived experience of all of us, whether having COVID, not having COVID, trying to, uh, so one of our best scenes is about intimacy and sex, sex during COVID. And the members of the collective, a changing morphing group of people who came because they care about HIV and the linked concerns of um, systemic inequality, at least in our country, the United States, listening to people talk about, just like we heard Veal and you know, how we're changing when, it, when our bodies aren't touched for a year, how we decide to have sex given its potential dangers. These are questions we thought about early on when we invented safer sex. So those zines are capturing a thoughtful group of activists in the middle of it. And um, you know, the, the better works, the bigger works, the more important works, the A-level works, which we all need as well, will come from this nascent representation that my collective and other collectives are doing in real time. So um, I, I, I am sustained by working with my collective. Um, and so that's a kind of care as well. And we have the name doula in our title because doula work, care work 
has always been central to HIV. What would an HIV doula do? Now what would a COVID-19 doula do? How do you hold people in times of transition and change that are produced by illness? How do you hold yourself and your community? These are the questions that we try and answer as a collective. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I think we covered most of what I would have liked to go through and the time went quite quickly and we already reached, unfortunately, the, um, the, the end of our time. Do you have any, any final thoughts? Everybody, something, one, two sentences. Um, what is it that, that is really key from your perspective, from your personal perspective, um, about care in this particular moment and time that we live in, Wieland? I would definitely use the moment, Alex, to thank you for the watermelon woman, because I think there you pioneered a whole other theme, which we are now processing on a wider scale, and uh, it all, all plays into one. And we just have to be aware, uh, that's uh, the main point, and, and, and see the perspective of things and not get lost in, in, in detail too much, but rather see the connection of race and classism, uh, the things that we talked uh, on today. I think these are the things that we have to deal with in, in the very near future on a possibly and hopefully new level. That's all I have to say at this point. Thank you. John? Um, when, when Alex and, and Vilan are talking about care, I was flashing back to one of my first Berlin memories. And it was uh, 1989 and the first time I was in the festival. And Vilan, you put me up, you and Manfred put me up at Tom's Bar with my boyfriend Colin. And Tom's Bar, upstairs from Tom's Bar. And every morning we would have breakfast around the communal table with Derek German. And Derek was there for Last of England, but he was completely focused on a friend he brought with him who was in the last stages of an untreatable disease called AIDS. And his whole focus in that, in that trip was not the festival, not the headlines, not the press junket, but taking care of his friend, doing the only thing he could do, which was this very impractical thing, like putting him through the the hassle of uh, international, international travel to come to Berlin to really end up staying mostly just at the hotel because he was too ill to go to screenings. But there was seeing, seeing Derek at that micro level taking care of his friend. It, 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 was, it, it registered, it, it, it epitomized for me the sort of care that we all exercised as a community or learned to exercise. We taught each other. Um, and I hope, echoing Alex, I hope we can, that's the, that's the crucial thing we should have in common with COVID today is being able to come, up, come, come invent new, new forms of care for each other in this very, very difficult time. Yeah, thank you. Alex, I would final, just say, final thoughts? Yeah, I, to me, um, Thank you, Vilan, for remember, connecting to the Watermelon Woman and thank you for premiering it, I, the, uh, which has made the life of the film possible. Um, and I think I would just note community. So I know John very well from decades of linked activist work around HIV and other issues that matter to us. And I know Vilan because I've come back to the Berlinality. Uh, I've been there three times with three different films. Um, and I think of this supportive community of, let's say, queer political folks interested in media and change in the world as my beloved community that has supported me in different ways. So there's, there's, I don't know Veland personally, but there's a connection that has been central that has sustained my career and the careers of other people whose work I need. And I know John, you know, as an activist and as an artist, maybe not intimately. And then there's my intimate close circle of friends and we need all of these forms of community care and that's what an activist community is. So, you know, thank um, the Teddies and Veland uh, and, and the Berlinale for producing a yeah. 
place where queer film has been supported and thrived and has changed the, you know, that part of you know, representational culture for the world. And thank you know, to John for the amazing films he makes that, that, that move in that way. So to me, it's a celebration of community and all of its complexity. Wonderful, that, that's very beautiful. I would like to thank all three of you uh, for being here and, and uh, discussing this not so easy uh, topics. Uh, I think it was a very fruitful conversation and I, what I particularly enjoyed is I think we went beyond what was planned. It was emotionally very moving and um, yeah, I thank all three of you for this experience and uh, I think this particular conversation also helped um, somehow preserving and and bringing back the memory of of the HIV and AIDS uh, crisis and 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 we were able to have some very important conclusions uh, for putting these two crises uh, next to each other and seeing how they reflect and weave into each other. I want to thank Jean Barr. I oh, said that right, you. I hope. Yeah, perfect. Uh, really, really smart programming, great questions. And also just to say that I find intergenerational work to be key for AIDS activism in particular. And, you know, thinking about sharing these legacies, but also learning from your experience now. And talk with the three of you. So thank you so much. And those of you who are we were following this talk, um, we will go on a short break. At four o'clock, we will be back with another um, talk about queering common space. Uh, so don't forget to come back at four o'clock and enjoy that talk as well. For me, this was the last talk um, here at the Berlinale this time. Hopefully in June, maybe in person, we can see each other. Um, but yeah, for this online version in March, I also say my goodbyes. Thank you for being here with us for this week. And yeah, I'm looking forward to the June, hopefully live version. Goodbye. Goodbye.